Hey, Josh, thanks for having me back on. Yeah, I appreciate it. We really had a great conversation the last time that you were on. We discussed, uh, and I'll put a link up to that in, in the video description up here. Uh, we were discussing the penal substitutionary atonement theory and, mm -hmm. and how we hashed that out. So that was a really fun interview. And you made a statement in that interview uh, just about uh, this subject in particular, how the Anabaptists approach war. And you said uh, a specific phrase. You said, uh, uh, the cause of Christ is the most noble of all causes, and I would never kill for the cause of Christ. So why would I kill for an inferior cause? And like mm -hmm. that was a mic drop moment, and I got tons of like messages like, hey, get that guy back on and talk about this. So that's what we're talking about. So give us a quick introduction to who you are in the meeting house and how people can connect with you. Okay, sure, will do. And I'll just say this too as a topical introduction. I'm so glad that people um, have something inside them that's stirring when this topic comes up because I think there is a new... Uh, resurgence, uh, a new reformation in a sense happening within the church on this one particular topic. I think it's one of the lost jewels in the crown of what Christian discipleship is all about. So I'm really glad that you're you're um, uh, putting making this the emphasis for this show. I think it's um, so important and I'm really excited for people who are just kind of tripping onto this way of thinking now, as I once did, all it was all new for me as a longtime Christian. And um, so I think something good is happening here. About me and our church, our church is called The Meeting House. Uh, it's easy to find online, themeetinghouse.com. And we are an Anabaptist church. Anabaptists are the uh, called the Radical Reformers. So you have the Protestant Reformation, where the Protestants kind of protest and break off from the Catholics, and then the Radical Reformation took that one step further. The Protestants got the Bible into everyone's hands, sola scriptura, and got people reading it for themselves. And the Anabaptists, or the Radical Reformers, were the students of the Protestant Reformers, the 20-somethings, who said, thanks for getting us the Bible in our own language and putting it in our hands, but as we read this, we don't think you're going far enough. And they challenged their mentors, the Protestant reformers, and said, we don't see you actually following Jesus in some of his key teachings. And so the Protestant church was just as violent as the Catholic church. And so that was one of the areas where their students, the radical reformers, said, we, we want to see change in our mentality toward violence as we follow Jesus. We don't just follow the Bible in general, but we follow Jesus specifically, and how does that change our ethic toward violence? So I'm part of that tradition. Our church, The Meeting House, is in the Toronto area in Canada, but we also have a home church network or house churches that are actually meeting around the world and uh, use our online teaching for a curriculum for, for house churches as well. Excellent. Well, it's like I said, it's exciting to have you back on. I think it's important that we probably speak to we try to disarm this conversation as quickly as possible because I think uh, people listening in uh, love to throw motives on, onto people that they don't know and that are on a computer screen. So before the YouTube chat starts blowing up with, uh, uh, you know, we fought in America and so many of our yeah. loved ones have died for this freedom, we don't mean by, by any stretch of the imagination to nullify that or dishonor that or discredit uh, the brave men and women who fought for our country. You're actually in Canada. So the mm -hmm. is, is the national pride of... of uh, love, uh, freedom, the pursuit of happiness. Is that is that the same kind of uh, nationalism up there? Canadian national pride is interesting because we're so close to America. Uh, we we uh, have strong national pride, which is half positive, this is what Canada is, and it's half in the negative, this is what Canada is not. Mm -hmm. And so often you'll find Canadians defining themselves by starting with America and saying, this is how we're not like the Americans, wow. which is not necessarily a very strong national identity to say, well, you know America, here's how we're different. But often Can Canadian culture is probably a perfect blend between American and, and British or European culture. We're kind of a, a blend of both. So it's like uh, you have your popular sibling that goes to school and they're all like, oh, you know that guy? Yeah, I'm his brother, but we're kind of different. Like you don't really want to take full credit for being from the same family, but you're, you, we're, we're both in North America, but but we're a little bit different. Yeah. Uh, it's a fun little vantage point because we, we get all American media. We're tracking with everything that our American brothers and sisters are tracking with, but with a sense of just one step removed. So we're kind of in the bleachers watching as an audience member and, and uh, 
and it's it's a fascinating place to be on the planet. That's interesting. Okay, so so when we're talking about this, I want to make sure that everyone who's listening doesn't hear us saying that any Christian in the military or any Christian that is a police officer that that we're saying that they're not actually Christians because they're they're mm. acting in these practices. We're not saying that they're not believers or followers of Christ or that they're that they're not honestly trying to follow Christ's command as faithfully as possible. We're just mm-hmm. trying to re-examine a text of scripture that has often been neglected, whether it be the Beatitudes of Christ or or uh, some of the other teachings from the apostles in the New Testament that suggest that we should turn the other cheek, that we should uh, you know lay our lives down for one another, that we should take the low road, uh, a road of, of peacemaking. So uh, mm-hmm. uh, any, any thoughts to that to continue to maybe de-escalate yeah. the, the initial yeah. part of this conversation? Yes, I'm so glad we're going to be doing two things at once. One is discussing the topic of the way of peace or pacifism. But the other thing we're doing is we have our conversation has a product or a desired outcome or a specific focus, but it also has a byproduct. It's what we're doing on the side. And the byproduct, I hope, of a conversation like this is increased unity, not increased fracture within the church. And part of that comes by just modeling the ability to have genuine disagreement within the body of Christ, but at the end of it saying, hey, we are still family, we love and respect one another, and the cross of Christ unifies us. I mean, that's one of the beautiful sociological miracles that Jesus was banking on to be a primary apologetic for the church in John 17, when he's praying to the Father, he's praying for the unity of the church so that the world may know that you sent me, he says to the Father. So the world, one of the evidences of the truth of Jesus is the unity that the church has, and that has to be a unity that is more than just a unity based on absolute agreement on every topic mm-hmm. because any any organization whether it's a political organization or another religious organization can have unity as long as they agree on everything but you get to see the miracle of unity when you have strong disagreement on specific topics and in the end you come out of that and say yeah but the cross of christ is still stronger than any disagreement we could ever have its unifying force makes us family we're stuck with each other so there's never a judgment of someone's christian maturity or Christian salvation, but we can honestly disagree about things. And I'm always happy to do that and do that well, because I think that's part of the apologetic of the church to say, see, we can still be family at the end of this kind of robust debate. Absolutely. And I think that's really important that uh, as we approach this, uh, this dialogue, this conversation, uh, it's like the Holy Spirit. You prayed this, you know, John 17, you know, he says, uh, the helper, the paracleto, the paraclete, you know, who I'm going to send you. Uh, he mm-hmm. talks about how this is going to be this unifying mark of the church, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, am I, am I, I don't want to confuse it with John 14, but uh, he, he, the Holy Spirit is coming to comfort, to, to bring them together. It's this unifying mark, and it's the thing that we disagree about the most. It's the thing that mm-hmm. actually ends up dividing the church is the, the, the way and the practice and the, the, the relationship that we have with the Holy Spirit. And our disagreement on that has split us. And here we are yes. going to start talking about peace, and I probably uh, am going to assume this is going to be one of the more heated dialogue sections in the comment uh, of YouTube and Facebook mm-hmm. here trying to mm-hmm. propagate peace, and this is going to be taken yeah. probably offensively. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's sadly ironic. It's very true. Um, and although we've come a long way, the, yeah. Yeah, during the time of the Protestant Reformation, uh, people who advocated the position that I'm going to be advocating were um, burned at the stake or drowned in rivers. Um, by the state on behalf of the church. And so you had Christians saying, you d- your, your teaching is such a threat because um, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't join the national army. They wouldn't fight for a Christian nation, so to speak, the people who held the peace position, mm. uh, the Anabaptists. Their teaching was such a threat that they were seen as a national threat to national security just by not engaging in war. Um, that and a variety of other reasons led to Christians killing other Christians because of their view about the peace of Jesus. And so I think the very fact we can have this conversation and no one's killing each other, I think it's already an upgrade. So we're doing we're doing well. Now, there have been uh, historians who have gone back and done a lot of research, even before the Protestant Reformation, but early, early church Christianity, and how mm-hmm. I, you don't want to say that it's unanimously uh, uh, the way of peace, but it is it is very majority. They were, they were what we would call pacifism. And before we even get into that, let's let's describe the difference. You mentioned this in one of your videos. You mentioned it in our last video, the difference between passivity, as in I'm not getting involved, and to pacify, to like make peace. Sure. Yeah, pacifism is a handy word because that's what most people recognize. But if we're going to use that word, 
we need to explain that pacifism always often often gets confused with passivity. So I will not be violent. In fact, I will not do anything. I will sit back. I'll reap the benefits of other people's violence to secure national security and safety. And I will do nothing because I'm a pacifist. But the word pacifist comes from the same root to pacify. You know, we talk about a, a soother or a pacifier or something. We give a child to help calm it. To pacify is an active word. And to be a pacifist is to say, I'm actively engaged in doing whatever I can. I am just not going to use violence. And sometimes I think the Christian church has lacked creativity in assuming if, if you're willing to use violence, you're willing to be active. And if you're not willing to use violence, I guess you're just passive as though there's there's not a large spectrum of creative options for engagement that are nonviolent. So we want to make sure that when we talk about being a pacifist, we're talking about being nonviolent, but still very active and very committed to doing what we can. Okay. And then let's, let's talk about early, early Christianity, if we can, even before yeah. uh, that we have the, the Protestant Reformation, we talk about the Anabaptists mm-hmm. and, and yeah. the, the radical for the reformers. First, for the first 300 years of the Christian church, uh, nonviolence was considered the norm. You said um, a majority, if not if not uh, exclusively all Christians, but it's actually pretty close to exclusively all Christians. We all Christian leaders whose writings that we have advocated the way of peace or nonviolence. We know that there were some Christians who were who uh, were in the military at that time, but the reason we know that is because we have letters from Christian leaders. Uh, advocating for them to withdraw from the military. Mm. Uh, so every writing we have from every Christian leader advocates this position for the first few generations of the Christian church, even though individual Christians might not have been applying it to their lives. Excellent. So that, uh, and that even that in itself suggests two things, that there are Christians that did believe in Christ Jesus, and they were asked mm-hmm. to change the way that they lived. So it wasn't it wasn't that what they were doing was anti-Christian. They were Christians, they were saved, but they were practicing in a way that some other leaders in the church uh, believed could could be changed, ought to be changed. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. And, go ahead. For our best understanding is this is a discipleship issue that has been an underrepresented voice in the church ever since Constantine. It was the dominant view for the first 300 years, and then uh, and then it, it becomes uh, a threat to the system once, once you have a, a Christian nation under Constantine and his successors. They need to have a standing army who will defend now Rome as, as a Christian nation. And so theology shifts at that point to protect the, the powerful or the, the Christian nation. And you can't have a nation of pacifists. The, any nation that itself, in a fallen world, just to exist as an earthly kingdom, you have to have violence or at least the threat of violence in order to exist, both to police within the state, but also to defend the borders of the state to outsiders. And if, if an entire nation who claims to be Christian also claims to be pacifists, that nation ceases to exist very quickly. I mean, if, uh, if, if America, which many Christians would say is a Christian nation, on whole de- declared themselves to be pacifist, America would cease to exist. I mean, even Canada could invade America on those terms. <laughs> we, uh, so, we, so we understand that there was a shift there, and, and, um, and theologians then went to work to, talk, to work on what became known as just war theory, which is justifying war from a Christian point of view and a, as an ethical war. But that was a new thing in the life of the Christian church at the time. So we want to point that out and say, yes, we actually disagree about this. We think that view is wrong, the just war view. But we think that's an inter, uh, inter-family debate around the dinner table as family members. And um, we hope that it, those who disagree with us, I think it's just great to hear this underrepresented voice in the church and um, and become aware of of what pacifists believe, even if it's not convincing to you. Yeah, and, and that's one of the things that we, we will talk about towards the end. So I encourage people to watch uh, toward the end of the program. I'm going to throw a couple of those common questions of, but what about the Roman centurion? Mm-hmm. Or what about these people who, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll throw some of those monkey wrenches in there at the end and say, Good. well, well, let's think through some of these things and talk. I know you're not afraid of that, and right. neither am I. Uh, but just for those who are listening, we're really trying to make the majority of this program to be able to present a position that most of Christendom has, has either not heard at all or completely neglected. So we're going to let Bruxy make the, the best best case that he can for this. We're going to talk about, uh, you know, church history, early church history, mid-church history, like uh, Reformation time, and then even we'll point to this. <laughs> we'll even talk about the Bible. Uh, that, that, was a, that was a slip of tongue. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about the scriptures that point to these things as well. 
Uh, but before we, we hop into that, uh, just for those who were listening, I had this on my notes here in my phone. Uh, Roland, that's it. Roland Baton is one who went back and did a historical uh, presentation of what I would call, and what most people would call pacifism in the early church or the way of peace. That's what Bruxy's talking about. So, so Bruxy, give us uh, some of the positions of the Anabaptists. We knew that they were some of the most martyred individuals in the Reformation history, both Catholics and Protestants were, were persecuting the Anabaptists. And it's not the position of the Anabaptists isn't a position of fear. It isn't a position of, uh, you know, uh, we're afraid of war. We don't want to go to war. It's not this. This isn't worth it. Uh, wh- what specifically is the position from the Anabaptists? Historically? Yeah, good. Thank you. And you're right. Anabaptists were never afraid to die for a cause. They believed it's always OK to die for a cause. It's just never OK to kill for a cause. And so Anabaptists were willing to be martyrs. And of course, the root for the word martyr, as many of us know, is to be a witness. And the early Christians, just like the Anabaptists, were witnesses for for their faith by dying well. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the mistakes that the the Roman persecutors of the early Christians would always make, is they would publicly execute Christians thinking that public execution would be a deterrent. But as they gathered crowds to watch how they would die in the arena, the way they died itself was such a witness to the peace of Christ that a new generation of converts would be produced Mm. because of how they died. And so Christian, Christian, the Christian faith has a history of beginning uh, through persecution and martyrdom actually becoming one of our primary forms of witnessing and advancing the kingdom of Christ. Um, And so Anabaptists in the 1500s now looked back at that and said, I think that's something the church has missed. The Catholic church has been violent for hundreds of years. Now the Protestant church is, is beginning and it's taking on the same mantle of violence. Mm-hmm. So you then have Catholic nations and Protestant nations going to war against each other and burning each other. For the sake of Jesus. Heritage. Pardon me? For the sake of Jesus. Or in the, yes, for the sake of Jesus. And so Anabaptists kind of called BS on all of that and said, no, this is, uh, we're missing the actual way of Jesus in the middle of this. And so, yeah, they were considered a third way, neither Catholic nor Protestant. Our Orthodox friends were not a part of this narrative here at this time. So uh, Anabaptists were considered a third way, neither Catholic nor Protestant, and were persecuted by both. But that gave them the opportunity to, like the early Christians, to die well and to make that their primary way of witnessing. And, uh, And so we would continue to say, uh, we, we want to be on the front lines in any way that is risky and may put ourselves in harm's way for the cause of Christ. We just would not kill for the sake of an earthly kingdom. So, you know, uh, I think one of the more popular pop culture references is your Hacksaw Ridge moment where the guy, mm-hmm. I want to say he's like a seventh day Advent, you know, he goes yeah. in, doesn't want to kill, but he doesn't, doesn't carry a gun doesn't have mm-hmm. medical training, you know, but he runs into the front lines, takes bodies, yeah. brings them back. Beautiful story, tearjerker, super powerful. But but this is kind of the imagery that you're suggesting. So so people who are involved, people who are drafted, people who have to obey the laws of the land, trying to find a balance between uh, obedience to the kingdoms and governments that are in charge of you, that have authority over you, while simultaneously not, not uh, disobeying the higher decrees of Christ to to fulfill those obligations. Is that right? Yeah, well, well done. And I think Hacksaw Ridge as a movie also did a fantastic job in doing that that secondary uh, thing we talked about earlier, which is producing a sense of respect for both sides. Mm-hmm. It didn't shame those who were just war Christians who were on the front lines fighting. What, one of the things that pacifists and just war Christians can have in common is that we are both willing to put our lives in harm's way for a cause. Now, one side is not willing to also kill for that cause, but at least in we can say in common, we celebrate the fact that we're willing to sacrifice our lives uh, for what we believe is a loving cause. Amen. Okay, so so let's let's top jump into scripture because there's a couple of thoughts, and I'm I'm gonna write this one down about. Um, especially when it comes in, I'm only letting you know because I want to circle back around to it later. Uh, yep. uh, the idea that during the Reformation you had Christian, uh, Catholic nations, and Protestant nations, and now we don't have. These, these kinds of uh, liturgical systems who are ruling our governments, and, and how does that shift? How does that change how Christians should get involved in practice? So I'd love to, I'd love to circle back around to that a little bit later. Uh, but let's talk about Scripture, if we can. Uh, mm, uh, what, what, what is the, 
man the apex of the, the 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 i keep i keep forgetting the name of the 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 pacifism position but the the way of peace there it is uh, yeah. what 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 is the 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 apex the scriptural text that we run to to say man this is where we're going to support our belief system this is where where yeah, jesus has commanded good. us to live this way well john's gospel begins by telling us that jesus not only preaches the word of god but is the word of god He's God who be, who is the Word of God and who then becomes flesh. And one of the beautiful things about that is that Jesus not only preaches the words of God, but his life uh, his life demonstrates what his mouth is preaching. So his he is God's show and tell. Everything about him makes very clear what his message is. Um, so we have um, we have I think in the teaching and example of Jesus. Um, a consistency, a, a very clear consistency that Jesus comes to lay down his life and calls his followers to pick up their cross, not their sword, but their cross, to be willing to die like him, which the early Christians interpreted, as we talked about earlier, to be martyrs as a form of witness, and then the Anabaptists picked up that tradition. And Jesus seems to teach that, I think, quite clearly whenever he talks about his own death. It's also interesting, too, whenever Jesus talks about his own death, you'll notice in the Gospels, like Matthew 16 and other places, uh, he will talk about his own upcoming death, and then his application, his immediate application to his disciples is always one of saying, and you need to pick up your cross also and follow me. He doesn't jump straight to what would be a more Pauline application and say, I'm going to die on the cross so that you don't have to. I will take take your sins away through the cross so you can simply accept that by faith, which is also true. Mm -hmm. But for Jesus, the discipleship issue in his own crucifixion is that don't think that that leaves you off the hook. You have to pick up your cross also and be ready to die along with me. And so... Uh, Jesus models, I think, in what he teaches, that would be the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Plain, Luke chapter 6, a very clear call to love our enemies and not just theoretically love them, but be willing to lay down our lives in loving them. Um, and that's in that's clearly, I think, in his teaching. And then we look at his example and he lives out what he teaches and he loves his enemies, including the Romans even as they're killing them, they're killing him, praying for their forgiveness, there just doesn't seem to be any wiggle room for uh, any other approach, according to Jesus. And then we have how the we have the early church applying this um, in Scripture. The Apostle Paul, for instance, in Romans 12, picking up this theme and teaching Christians the way of peace, the way of picking up your cross, never picking up your sword, and. Um, and so the, the teaching both from Jesus on to the apostles that's rooted in scripture and then the early church fathers after that seems um, uh, uh, undeniably consistent. Yeah. Okay. So we're, we're, we're looking at these, these texts where Christ, uh, hey, you know, you guys lay your life down for your brothers. But then right before they go into Jerusalem, he says, hey, pick up your sword, you know, uh, make sure that you got an extra one on you, that kind of thing. Peter probably has this idea, that, oh, okay, you know, we're getting we're getting amped, you know, I'm a zealot, I'm ready to like take over Rome, I got my swords ready, I'm chopping some ears off, like he's like ready, you know, so taking off some heads. And then he whacks his dude's ear off and Jesus is like, hey, Peter, you live by the sword, you die by the sword, what's up, man? So like, yeah. w what is this text about from, from this mm -hmm. position to suggest, it sounds like Jesus is getting the guys ramped up for war, and then turns around and is like, hey, why are you chopping guys' ears off? Like, it, yeah, it seems yeah. a little confusing. It's, in Luke's gospel, uh, Jesus mentions, in Luke's gospel. Oh, I think we might have might have lost you there for a second. So uh, we're talking about, still there? Uh, there he goes. I got you. Or, you're you're, oh, you're oh, frozen. Nice. I'm so for, I'm so sorry. Uh, we, we left you at in Luke's gospel. Ah, oh, poor guy. Keeps getting frozen. That Toronto internet, what are you going to do? Well, for all of those of you who are watching online right now, I apologize that uh, someone's internet speed might not be super great. It might be ours, to be honest, but we'll wait, we'll wait, we'll wait. Brooks, you still there? Oh, he's gone, everybody. There he is. Let's cut right back to it. You there? Hi, hi. Sorry, sorry about that. No, it's okay. Yeah, so you said in Luke's gospel. That's where I left off. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. So in, in Luke's gospel, Jesus talks about it's time to get a sword. And his disciples say, well, here are two swords. 
And Jesus says, that is enough. Yeah. Then the conversation moves on. There's no real explanation. And we wonder, why did Jesus say that is enough? Um, is he saying that's enough as in that's enough of this conversation? You guys have misunderstood me because sometimes Jesus, in fact, often Jesus speaks metaphorically. He uses terms like sword and other terms uh, the way a rabbi would, which is uh, either through which is rabbinic um, imagery as um, and Jesus in the book of Revelation is pictured with the sword coming out of his mouth as the word of God. Mm -hmm. And so maybe Jesus was trying to teach them about the sword as the word of God and they grabbed physical swords and he said, that's enough. Once again, you have misunderstood me. That is a theme in the gospels of Jesus teaching one way and his disciples misinterpreting it because they think it's time for the kingdom of Israel to be established through force. Or Jesus may have been saying that's enough. Two swords will provide the illustration because actually I'm, I'm going to allow you to make the mistake of thinking that physical swords are how I'm going to bring about the kingdom, and I will rebuke you for it, and that will be a very clear testament. Uh, either way, what we know it couldn't have been, what it couldn't have been has, is Jesus saying, two swords are enough for us to launch this violent revolution and spread the gospel through violence which is the one way that many Christians want to use that passage and to say, well, Jesus said to pick up a sword. Well, but he never, that couldn't have been enough to pick up a couple swords for his 12 disciples and to somehow conquer the Romans. And in fact, if we're in doubt, just continue reading the story and see how Jesus responds when any of his disciples like Peter thinks it's okay to use one of those swords mm -hmm. and then keep reading through the book of Acts. And you realize that, no, that's not how his earliest disciples then continue to uh, interpret his teaching long term. So I think the one interpretation we rule out is that Jesus was somehow switching gears and saying, I taught turn the other cheek in the Sermon on the Mount, but now I'm saying just war, use violence to advance my kingdom. No early Christian interpreted his teaching that way, or if they did, they were immediately rebuked for it. Okay, so uh, here's here's an interesting thought. So we have this this non, uh, what is it, the non, non, non-democratic uh, sense of these individuals are being taught by Christ. They're supposed to say submitted to the governments that are over them, right? They don't have the ability to vote or get involved or be be responsible, autonomous individuals. They're just to, to be sub submissive and subordinate to the, the ruling governments, right? But then mm -hmm. these things happen where these nations now start giving us power to be involved and to, to, to vote. So so Jesus was speaking to them in their context, right? I'm just framing the argument, right? So, yep. so Jesus is speaking to them in their context of how they should Live, but now that we have these nations that we can be involved in, that we can participate in, doesn't this doesn't this theme of Christianity shift a little bit? Mm -hmm. And it may shift to give us more privilege to be involved in politics. We we get to vote and we get to express opinions, maybe in a way that they didn't in Roman times. But at some point, one has to ask the question: How far can we go in our involvement? before we start crossing a line in the teaching of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Many things in government and in culture have shifted since the first century, but there's still some absolutes in what it means to follow Jesus. We don't just follow political trends or cultural trends. And so, yes, there's been shifts and there's been new opportunities, but at some point we don't just ride the train of new opportunities without saying, wait a second, where, where is Jesus laying down the track for the Jesus mm -hmm. train and how, and where are we going too far? And violence seems to be a consistent teaching in the way of Jesus. There doesn't seem to be any out that um, you should be peaceful uh, toward even the Romans and love your enemy only for now, or only because it's a totalitarian government, or only because, frankly, if you picked up arms, you wouldn't have a chance of winning. So, so why don't we just wait until sometime in the future where you can pick up arms? And there's just no hint that this is anything but just the way a disciple of Jesus should live. Okay, so when 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 discussing that, maybe we should define um, what we're advocating against when you say mm -hmm. peace, right? So what is uh, this this way of peace? Um, when when you decide that you take on that position, you're suggesting that war is uh, uh, prohibited by Christians. Christians cannot participate in the active shedding of blood of individuals that they're at war with. But but what other levels of violence are we talking about? How do how do we define this way of peace? You said uh, just like uh, the early, we have to define what was Jesus saying. Is it all violence? Any violence? Someone comes into your home, attacks your family. Should you defend them? Like those become very hairy and difficult questions. Yeah, that's good. Can can we get to that slowly first by looking at at war in general and explain? I'd like to point out that it's not just an arbitrary, tacked on teaching of Jesus. And by the way. 
one of the ways you'll show the world that you're my disciple is by being nonviolent. Um, it's not just attacked on extra, but seems to grow out of the worldview of Christianity, which is to say that when you become a follower of Jesus, you become a citizen of a different kingdom. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're not a, you're not just a citizen of Israel or of Rome in the first century or of Greece, and you're not just a citizen of Canada or America or any other earthly kingdom. First and foremost, you are a citizen of the Jesus nation, of the kingdom of Christ. And, and as far as your relationship with the earthly nation that you find yourself in, it is less a relationship of being a citizen of, say, America, but of being an ambassador to America on behalf of the other nation you're actually a citizen of, which is the Jesus nation. So an ambassador, let's say if you were an ambassador to France on behalf of America, well, although you might be living in France and you would know French culture and you would be participating in French life in many ways, your purpose there is to represent America. You have to know the policies of the president. You have to represent America well in France. Your purpose being there is not just to blend in as a good citizen of France. It's actually to understand the culture, live in the culture, but to represent a different way of living and different policies. And if France went to war, for instance, you wouldn't join the military in France because that's not your country. You're, you're not a citizen of France. You're representing a different nation. And that's very much the worldview of what a Christian is. No matter where you live on the planet, you're an ambassador to that country more than you are a citizen of that country. Um, and so when that country goes to war, you are, you're still one who is representing the, uh, the country of Christ in that sense. And Christians then go to war, but our war is not against flesh and blood. It's a spiritual war that we are a part of. And, and so um, once we understand this, we see that the teaching of Jesus is, again, not just uh, an extra call to love, but it, is, it grows out of who we become in Christ and our, our allegiance to the kingdom of Christ. And then that changes our allegiance to any other earthly nation. Excellent. So, so this primarily, when it comes to war, uh, we view ourselves as ambassadors is, is the teaching of the way of peace, right? So, but what about those secondary issues? Those, you know, if I'm in France and someone comes in to attack my kids, you know, I still, as far as I can tell, defend my children. So, so yeah. how, how, you know, <laughs> the, w- when someone comes in with a gun, you're like, uh, Hey brother, let's make peace. Like, do you have right, time right. for those kinds of things? Uh, right, right. So good, g- great question. And so a couple of things to point out that's even behind the question mm-hmm. is that, uh, remember that we do suffer from a lack of creativity when it comes sure. to potentially violent scenarios. The assumption is, Am I going to pick up a gun and do something or am I just going to be passive and do nothing? And I think even when we look at, at not only anecdotal stories, but some of the statistics, um, having a gun doesn't always necessarily lead to a solution when not having a gun and not being violent leads to a lack of a solution, that it's quite possible to be very active and creative in bringing about a solution to a potentially violent scenario without using violence itself. Um, So there's a lot of assumptions in a question like that. Uh, What are you going to do if someone breaks into your house? Are you going to just do nothing? That I want to first challenge the assumptions. And then say, as someone who's committed to action, I would do whatever I can short of perpetrating more violence. And and knowing that, let's just play this out for a little bit. Um, The assumption behind, am I going to be violent in order to bring about peace, assumes a lot of things. First of all, it assumes that I have a gun or it, or I have a baseball bat or that I'm really good with my fists or whatever. It assumes that if I am able to get my hands on a gun, maybe it's the perpetrator's gun. Maybe he's put it down for a second and I'm able to grab it. It assumes that I know how to use it and it assumes that I'm a good shot and it assumes that I shoot him, just wound him, protect my family. It's, it assumes that his threat of violence was real and not just, uh, not just designed to intimidate while he robs the house or does what he wants, that maybe he was just threatening violence but never intended to pull it off. But my choice to be violent actually is what escalates the situation and creates uh, a murder that wasn't going to occur. So there's so many assumptions that violence works, nonviolence doesn't. Rather to say, um, I think that whether it is verbal de-escalizing of violence or it is putting oneself in harm's way in a way that is not trying to kill the another person while protecting another person. Um, 
regardless of which it is, there are there's an entire spectrum of creative nonviolent solutions that could be tried. And then having said that, in the end, whether you pick up a gun to use violence or you don't, either way it might backfire and you may die. Backfire you know, is a is a interesting yeah, choice true. of words. <laughs> yeah. And either way, it might not work. It's true. Yeah. And and you may die. Yeah. But I would prefer die to die. If I do die in that scenario, in that home invasion scenario, I want to die knowing that I was following Christ to the bitter end, not in the last moment saying, Chuck that. I've now got to beat this guy up or shoot him or something to make sure that um, that I, I protect either my own life or the life of someone else. I want to choose the creative Jesus-oriented solution. And I think I think that we can, uh, you know, even in, in, in your description, I think that there there may be assumption that uh, they're only, yeah, like peop- that, that we're not already assuming, you know, even the, the just war people aren't already assuming, hey, let's talk this guy down. I was in a, in a recently in a Starbucks. It happened last year, I want to say maybe, maybe at most six months ago. And uh, this older gentleman uh, didn't get his handicapped parking spot. I happen to know this guy pretty well. Okay. Um, he comes into Starbucks. We chatted up really well. Older guy, like a nom vet, like just, just a tough old scraggly dude, uh, giving his life back to Jesus, you know, just really, really working on it. Right. But he happens to be pretty excessively racist okay and mm-hmm. and uh you know i i belong to a church where my, my senior pastor is black we're a very interracial uh community of believers and uh, uh this this young black kid parks in the handicap spot right and he he's not handicapped right he's just getting a drink real quick jumps out well he didn't get his handicap spot right uh, this this biker dude and he threw a fit and in this mm-hmm. starbucks they jump at each other's throat i mean they're yelling they're cussing they're screaming they like jump up you know i happen to be the one jumps in between them right holding them both down pushing them back apart i mean it was like a movie scene right so we didn't assume instantly jason Bourne. i didn't like grab the chair break the legs off of it and start beating both of these guys to de-escalate the situation right but uh, but i think within that we can assume that most even just were christians that have the heart of christ they don't want to kill somebody they don't want to like put someone down uh there is so many precautionary measures that go in before or uh, my kids, or this guy, um, mm-hmm. and 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 to be fair, I, I think that most Christians would attempt to de-escalate a situation. Well, I would hope. Mm-hmm. I don't know that to be true, but but I would hope. You know that most yes. Christians would try to approach this to say, you know, uh, life is sacred. We're created in the Imago Dei. We don't want to mar that image. Um, uh, however, even as we, we discussed, you know, like Romans, I want to say it's chapter 13. It talks about how government is used. You, you even used it yourself. Government is used in the threat of violence to, to create an organizational structure. And within the, the government, there is church. Siri is like trying to make commands here. So there's, you know, there's, there's government, there's church, and there's family units that God has structured within that. Don't we also discipline our children? Don't we excommunicate people? Isn't there levels of, of, I mean, it's not violence, but it's some level of order and structure that God has implemented. Yeah, I love what you're saying here, but can I just question you about your graphic there, your hand graphic? Sure, please. Are you saying the church is a subcategory of the state? No, 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 absolutely not. Just to say, and and, and that was that was a very clever uh, uh, correlation, though. How I, how I made the church smaller than the nation. You're you're, you're quick. Um, no, that was that was a good catch uh, in the sense that there's an maybe we'll do it this way: nation, church, family. Yes, yes, is that, yes. does that sound good? There's our earthly kingdom and there's our heavenly kingdom, the kingdom of God on earth, mm-hmm. and we have citizenship in one. And ambassadorship to the other, right? And and when we talk about the family unit, when we talk about the church, there are different set of governing principles. Christ says this is an institution. This ought to be governed this way. Mm-hmm. When bad mm-hmm. things happen, there's discipline that should be, you know, the Heidelberg Catechism, you know, administration of the sacraments, the preaching of God's word, and church discipline. Right? You know, you've got the the family unit. You know, love your children. Don't provoke them to wrath, but discipline your children, love your wife. Like there are commands within the family unit on how it's to be organized and structured, the church yeah. and in the nation. So, so wouldn't you say even within those, those subcategories that there are ways that we are to protect yes. and those kinds of things. And so it's interesting in Romans 12 and 13, and maybe it would be worthwhile for us just to walk through that because we, we can all know that Jesus teaches very clearly peace in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, and the Sermon on the Plain, Matthew 6, but or sorry, Luke chapter 6. But it's, it might be helpful to even look how the Apostle Paul worked that out practically for the early church. Because here, he, 
it raises the same question. At what point you're supposed to be uh, submitted to the state, you're supposed to be submitted to the governing authorities over you. So at what point do you draw the line then and say, I'm not going to go any further? And it's, it's really interesting. He draws the line at paying your taxes, which is where Jesus did as well. Pay your taxes, give to Caesar what has Caesar's image on it. And the Apostle Paul ends the same place, pay your taxes. And, and so you're not People say, well, pacifists are benefiting from the violence of the state without participating in violence themselves. Well, that's what most citizens of any nation do anyway. Well, We're not all vigilantes. I mean, even police officers will say, don't take the law into your own hands. Let us do our job. So if you pay your taxes, you are submitting to the state and funding the state to do what the state does without personally participating. We're not all police officers or army soldiers. So Paul does draw the line there, and you can... You can always philosophically say, but if you pay your taxes, your taxes may be going to support violence. And in a fallen world, that's just always going to be the state, the, the case. So we can say we're anarchists, we're off the grid, we are not going to pay tax. But Paul says, no, live in submission in any country you find yourself, pay your taxes, but remember, ultimately, you're a citizen of a different nation, and you're there to be an ambassador to that nation about the, the way of Jesus. Okay, so... Um Man, there's there's a lot of thoughts and a lot of tangents, and we're already 41 minutes into this. This is a, uh-huh. this is really a fascinating topic. So when we when we look at Romans 12, he says, "Hey, pay your taxes," uh, but the government is to 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 this judgment, this threat of this threat of judgment that's going to help govern these these entities, these people. Um, we see that in like Leviticus, we see this in the law, you know, that there is violence and the threat of violence that keeps people in line. You know, little Billy uh, saw someone murder, no, someone was murdered and uh, little Billy watched the stoning of this individual and they're like, wow, I'm not going to murder again, right? There's this threat of violence that's pre- presented yeah. that, that people are raised in that keeps this, this almost like a moral deterrent that keeps people from, or an immoral deterrent, I should say. Um, yeah. Uh, that, that's placed in front of them, and we know the law doesn't work. But but you mentioned it yourself. Like, do do we call the police officer? Like, do you know? Hey, someone's broken into my house. I know the police officer is going to use violence. You know, like like how mm-hmm. how how do I navigate those situations? Or even worse, you know, we talk about uh, shootings. You know, in America, where police officers are gunning down, uh, yeah. uh, you know, young men and women, and how. Wouldn't we want Christians behind the other end of that firearm opposed to having someone who's who doesn't have a Christian sense of morality in that mm. situation to talk and de-escalate that? You know, it sounds as if we're encouraging the um, the the non-Christian, which I think did, we deduce is therefore immoral, uh, into those positions of leadership and judgment. Uh, doesn't yeah. doesn't that... well, first of all, can I just say a challenge again? An assumption behind the question: the yeah. assumption is that Christians make inherently better leadership and and authoritative decisions and 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 potential. I'm just saying when, moral decisions. <laughs> and, in, and well, it's interesting because we don't have any track record of Christians in leadership actually doing a better job than non-Christians. Uh, some of the worst uh, leaders in history have can, have been Christians, Mo- and whether it's most prime ministers in Canada or most presidents in the United States, both good ones and bad ones claim to be Christians. Sure. And so saying, well, get a Christian in government or get a Christian behind the gun, and they'll you get Constantine to be the emperor and all will be well mm. is not necessarily the case. Sometimes it's the worst thing that happens for the church because the church falls in love with power mm. and the church says, Hey, through power, we can either use the sword to conquer and advance the cause of Christ. What, what better use for the sword is there? Or the church says through legislation and through law, we can advance the cause of Christ rather than through winning hearts one by one and serving from the bottom up. We fall in love with the top down approach to bringing about societal change. So, um, Non-Christians still have the law of God on their heart, as Romans chapter two says, and um, so I'm not I'm not convinced. We can't turn to the teaching of Jesus to say, "Teach me how to steward power well," and that can't be part of our discipleship program in the church. How to steward power really well, because Jesus teaches us how to lay down power hmm. and to give up power, and so He doesn't have a lot of teaching that you can apply to being president or prime minister or police officer or soldier say, Hmm, when to fire the gun, when not to fire the gun, I'll consult, consult the sermon on the Mount to try and learn how to use my violence in a Christian way. There is no teaching on how to use violence in a Christian way. So I don't think that being a Christian gives you the advantage in those scenarios because Jesus would just say, lay it down, lay it down, lay it down. Yeah, no, and I, and I absolutely understand the position. And I only mean to say that, 
um, that people who are regenerate, it's, it's hard to, you start using the title Christian. And like you said, mm-hmm. we've got a million presidents who've claimed Christianity, uh, whether that's the case or not, um, between them and God. But the, the sense that a person who is regenerate, who, who is committed to mm-hmm. man being created in the Imago Dei, in the image of God, that there is, I would hope, an inherent sense of morality that is then projected upon themselves and on the people around them, that they ought to treat in a different way. They ought to live in a different way. In the same way that you would say that a Christian ought to serve selflessly uh, from the bottom up, uh, that you know, you you assume I think in the same that that Christians are in in a sense a little bit more moral uh, from the the bottom up in serving, and the way that non Christians don't, wouldn't you? It's a great catch. But if a Christian says I because I am regenerate and I have, um, follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, therefore I should be the one in charge, or I should be the one with violence on my side, I would say you're already now. Again, this 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 is my view. And, no, no, and, I understand. No, you know, this is it's a safe place, Brooks. <laughs> okay, I said that Christian is already walking away yeah. from his role as a disciple of Jesus, which is yeah. to be a student or an apprentice of the way of Jesus, and saying, "I will pick up arms in order to do society good." I trust their, I trust their heart. They want to do society good, but the idea of picking up the sword in any form to do society good is something that Jesus counsels against. So, a Christian who is out of step with their own discipleship and following Jesus, I don't think is an upgrade. And even if they are regenerate, they're currently in a process of making decisions that is outside of the way of Christ. Yeah. And I, and, and like, you know, this is really engaging. I'm actually very sympathetic to the position that you hold. I really, really like it quite a lot. Uh, but there are just those things that I, I have a buddy, um, he's in, in seminary up in, in North Carolina and we call all the time and he asks me these questions like really intense. And I realize. You're, you're trying to get me to prove or disprove your position because you want some assurance in this area. And that's all I'm trying to, I'm trying to work through this with you. And I feel like you're a great sounding board. So, so when, when, uh, I, again, when talk about the, the police officer who, you know, I want the Christian behind the gun opposed to the non-Christian, I look at that and I go, well, that's not, that's not a Christian saying, I want the leadership, I want the power, but in the same way, we call them civil servants here in America. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I want the Christian to be able to be the intermediary because often the police officer is not the guy who's supposed to show up on the scene, guns ablazing, and, you know, this isn't Jason Bourne, right? Like, we're not, right. I love right. that series, by the way. Uh, it's it's not the guy who shows up trying to, 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 to release rounds to solve the problem. Hopefully, it's a person who's there to de-escalate the situation so they don't have to use violence. Absolutely, and, and certainly the best police officers are, they know that that is their job and that is their role, and we're so grateful for that. Um, having said that, though, if that is your heart, then as a disciple of Jesus, I would suggest getting a job as a negotiator or an sure. intermediary. Why have as your backup the possibility that you will be in a position, in order to do your job well, in a position of killing someone, um, I w- we would just say that's not a job that is wise for a Christian to take. Because here's where I think a Christian will make a, a, a less of a good police officer because a Christian should really wrestle with the morality where you have the instincts of saying, that person is threatening in this moment. I may be giving them a warning. I've got to reach for my firearm and I've got to shoot for the torso. And I'm not just going to like a wild Western shoot them in the hand and shoot the gun out. Or I got to shoot to, to kill. In that moment, there's only two kinds of people I have the opportunity to kill. Either that other person I'm about to kill is a Christian or they're not a Christian. I mean, they're regenerate or they're not. Uh, Mm -hmm. I assume they're not if they're committing this crime. Uh, And if they're not, then in this moment, I am determining that they have lost any hope of salvation in this life. and, um, And this is their day to go to hell. If they are a Christian, then they are my brother, a misguided brother, and I need to reconcile with them or to church discipline them, but I, I don't get to shoot them. Uh, but there's, there's, there's no one on the other end of my firearm that I, as a Christian feel that I'm in a position to end their life right now, whether it, whether that person's a non-Christian, I mean, if they're a non-Christian, it's better that I die than they die. I'm ready to meet my maker. They need as much hope they can of salvation as possible. So I would think that even that moral dilemma would make me a lousy police officer because I'd be in a moment where I'm called to respond according to my instincts. And I'd be saying, Lord, help me in this moment. Should I lay my life down? Because that's what a Christian does, right? Lay yeah. my life down and give that person every last hope. And and so I, I, I think that a Christian in the wrong job may not be the best person in that job. No, no. And I, I totally understand. You know, there's, there's, 
so many different situations. You know, you don't have one guy holding a gun on another guy. You've got a guy holding a gun on a school or a, you know, a movie theater or a whatever. Um, and, and then, yeah, there's, there's tons of uh, theoretical moral. It's, it's funny when, when we like to sit in these situations, we create, concoct these, these horrible, horrible scenarios that 99.9% of, of us are never going to live in. We're never going to exist in, but we want to wrestle yeah, with yeah. it on this side. Yeah, uh, it's almost like people trying to decide what their position is on abortion by saying a uh, 13-year-old girl is raped by her uncle. What's your position on abortion? And it's, you can still get to a point of clarity, but it's trying to find the most emotionally yeah. laden, uh, you know, inflammatory scenario. And that's why I think it's important to start with scripture. And if, if we say Jesus clearly taught the way of peace and nonviolence even towards your enemies in how you love them, the Apostle Paul validates that. And the early church for 300 years interprets the teaching in this same way. And if we say that's clear, then we can go into these other scenarios and say, well, then let's look at case studies. But we're looking at case studies with the question of how can I apply the teaching of Jesus to this scenario, as opposed to trying to use case studies as a way of finding excuses not to follow the That's teachings good. of Jesus. And, 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 and just for everyone who's listening, you know, you're not you're not appealing for, hey, everyone, allow bad guys to come in and murder a bunch of people. You're just saying, how can we, if we're going to be Christians— uh, uh, little Christs, we're going to be little anointed ones, if that's what we're going to be doing on the earth, mm-hmm. how closely can we follow Jesus' teachings? If we're disciples of his way, How you're, you're just talking about a radical commitment to the way of Jesus, right? I just want to make sure that everyone's listening. Bruxy is not saying like, hey, uh, you know, let the bad guys rule the world. We shouldn't touch them. You know, he's saying, how do we follow Jesus at any at whatever that price may be, uh, and I think that's at least that's commendable. Um, whether you agree with them or disagree with them, you should at least acknowledge, man, the the ability to walk into any scenario and say, "I'm going to lay my life down here, and I won't take a life," is a commendable approach. Um, mm-hmm. So, so uh, as as we continue down the rabbit trail, I mean, we've got like nine minutes left. That's horrible. I don't like this at all. Um, uh, uh, you're talking about the the just war theory. Can we can we circle back down to maybe Leviticus? Go back down to the law in the judicial system and it suggests mm-hmm. you know the law is is lawful when used lawfully right so the the law is righteous it is good and it commands the stoning of wicked it, it commands the death penalty for people who do bad so as a mm-hmm. christian who gets to vote if we get to vote in death penalty if we get to vote in those mm-hmm. how does a christian line up in these nonviolent situations when we know this is a good governmental system this is what the government should do. Should a Christian vote for or against those things? So just go yeah. ahead and unpack one of the most uh, heated Christian conversations in like six minutes. That'd be great if you could Hooray. do that. <laughs> <laughs> one of the, the answers or the principles that will help us work toward an answer is the concept of the kingdom and how that is modified between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So in the Old Testament, the, the earthly kingdom and the heavenly kingdom are the same thing. Um, God's kingdom is Israel, and so God's kingdom is both a political and a religious kingdom fused together. It's a geographical kingdom. It has a plot of land, and that, again, as we talked about, needs violence or the threat of violence in order to obtain the land and then defend the land, etc. And in the New Testament, God's kingdom is off the map. It is it's transcendent of territory. Mm-hmm. It is the rela- a relational kingdom of people who belong to other earthly kingdoms, but we're all family together. We're all part of the Jesus nation. And so warfare in the new covenant is a spiritual war, and we just happen to be living in a particular earthly kingdom. Uh, so, so the violence of the Old Testament, a kingdom of God, is both a political and religious violence because of the nature of its kingdom. The New Testament, all of the violence that we perpetrate is against Satan and his angels. That's the war we participate in, and we we don't the the, the we're not citizens even of any particular earthly nation. The way Israel was a citizen of God's earthly nation in the Old Testament. So we can't just draw lines of parallel from the old covenant and try to click drag and drop that into the new covenant and say, that's how we live. We're actually under a new covenant that has a new, a whole new way of engaging with God and with others. Excellent. Well, you knocked it out of the park in a, in a quick, uh, quick minute there. So uh, uh, I really appreciate you for coming on. I, I want you to encourage those who are watching um, materials to read, whether that be books, uh, sermons to listen to uh, places that have helped um helped encourage this form of thought in you? So people who are Mm -hmm. wanting to research it, wanting to study it, how, how do they go about that? Where would you point them? Sure. Great. Um, 
one, one thing you can do is just look up Anabaptists online and do some of your own Googling and research. Another is um, if you want to hear a teaching series that we have done on this, you can uh, go to themeetinghouse.com and you'd have to go back quite a few years, but look for a series called Inglorious Pastors. And Inglorious Pastors is our six. <laughs> seven is that based off of the movie? <laughs> Yes, it is. It, we came out about the same time as the movie. So. <laughs> yes, good, good. I'm glad you picked that up. Well done. So it, it, uh, it, and it just walks through what just war theory is. Um, remember, just war theory is our best human theory to steward violence from a Christian point of view. We can't find it in the Bible. There is no just war theory in the Bible. What we do find, if you're talking about Old Testament physical violence, you're talking about holy war, not just war. Mm. The principles of just war are not found in scripture. Old Testament violence is not just war. It would never qualify Mm -hmm. this. We are just going in and killing civilians as well as combatants. And we are, because God's told us to, there's no just war in the Bible. It's holy war. So we just walk through some of these understandings that, and I confess, this was all new to me. I didn't grow up with this. I had a sense, and maybe some people who are watching, some people watching are just saying, this is ridiculous. I I don't want to hear anymore, but some people are- They're all from Texas. (laughs) Yeah. Some people watching this and why did I never hear this before? I feel a little ticked off that no one at least even presented this point of view to me when growing up in the church. And that was my experience is that I just had a, where have you been all my life experience with this whole way of thinking? And some, some things started to click together very quickly when kind of some blinders were taken off and I was given permission to look at, at Christian ethics from a different point of view. Mm-hmm. And so whether people agree or they disagree, I, th- I hope that this will be a part of their discipleship process as they re-engage with the teaching of Jesus from uh, with with just a broader understanding of the Christian church. Excellent. And then finally, uh, for for those that are in the states or abroad that are participating in the military, that are in the mm-hmm. uh, the armed, uh, they're, 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 the armed forces that would be the military. Uh, you know, our our civil servants, you know, police officers, those kinds of things, security guards, the, any anything, anyone's got a badge and a gun. What would your encouragement be? to people in that position. Um, you know, we have, we didn't get to cover the, the, the Roman centurion that Jesus said, you know, great is your faith or, or Paul, when, when he goes to the, the man, uh, the first Gentile convert of, of the Italian cohort, right? He's like the armed mm-hmm. special forces of, of, of the Italian army there. So, yes, yes. so these guys are violent men, right? Uh, mm-hmm. they didn't, they didn't ask them to repent. Maybe, maybe kind of cover that a little bit for those who are Christians who are in this position sure. and go, what do I do? Yeah, I think that's it's important to point out that we have no record of any ethical instruction by Jesus or by Paul when they come across soldiers who want to follow Jesus. So some will say, well, there's, you know, he didn't tell um, Cornelius or Paul didn't tell Cornelius or Jesus didn't tell a Roman centurion to leave the army. We have no record of Jesus telling him anything <laughs> about about any, and we got to assume there, there's things in his life that he would have needed to change in order to follow Jesus. But that's just not recorded. There's nothing recorded. So I don't, I think the argument from silence becomes a bit of a reach to say we can shift from the way of peace to just war theology just because Jesus doesn't uh, say anything to the Roman centurion. Um, be happy to serve with you. So God bless you for doing that. And then I would also say, since we are brothers and sisters, uh, to say that uh, I would just love to challenge you, as I would challenge all Christians, to uh, give a second pass at the teachings of Jesus, a reconsideration of of the possibility that he meant completely what he said, that Christians are not to bear the sword in any fashion, even to try and accomplish good, and to say uh, your leadership gifts, your people skills, uh, the, the insight that you have, which qualifies you probably to be a good soldier or a good police officer, that those may be better used for the kingdom of Christ in different ways. Uh, some of our uh, some of our um, best leaders that could be leaders within the church are out there in the world leading what well sometimes leading to secular corporations or businesses, but are also leading in the military or in policing or in politics. When I think there may be other callings for you that um, that would that where God was, is going to use your gifts in different ways. And I'd, I would want to just encourage you to be open to that as your brother. Excellent. Well, thank you, Bruxy, for coming on the program. Uh, we were literally wrapping up with seconds left. Uh, it's an honor to have you on the show once again. Uh, I, I'm glad we were able to unpack as much as we talked about. And we'll probably mm. end up having someone come on in the near future to talk about just war, just to keep everything uh, as as balanced, as equally extreme in all directions as we possibly can. So uh, yeah. we appreciate all of those who are watching Remnant Radio. If you're new to the program, we stream live every Monday night at 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. You can tune in every Monday evening 
evening and watch the live stream or uh, jump on on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Just know that every single Monday there will be a new episode out there for you. Uh, this has been a really exciting episode. Again, a big honor uh, to have you back on the show. Really enjoyed the dialogue. Uh, we uh, Bless you guys. If y'all want to donate, if this ministry has been a blessing to you, go to our website at theremnantradio.com, and we'll see you next week. Be blessed. Bye. Bless you.